Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's my great uh, honor to be introducing the keynote speaker of uh, this year's Jane Conference, uh, my academic guru, Professor Alexis Sanderson. Uh, Professor Sanderson, he read classics and Sanskrit at Oxford in, I think it was 1967, is that correct? He went up. Um, and then uh, after completing his degree, spent seven years in Kashmir studying with, uh, I think, the last great uh, scholar of the Shaiva traditions of Kashmir. He then returned to Oxford and from 1977 to 1992 was the lecturer in Sanskrit at the Oriental Institute. And then since 1992, he's been the Spalding Professor of Eastern Religions and, and Ethics at Oxford and uh, a fellow of All Souls College. Professor Sanderson's uh, work has concentrated on the Shaiva tantric traditions in particular, but the tantric traditions more broadly. And as long, as, long, as, long ago as 1988, he wrote uh, an article called Shaivism and the Tantric Traditions, which was a, a masterpiece at the time because it mapped the, uh, mapped the whole world of Tantra and Shaivism in India. And I still, even though it's an encyclopedia article, I still... Uh, regularly refer to it, so dense and rich is it. Um, but since then, his work has expanded and built upon uh, that foundation, and through examining the whole uh, broad range of these Shaiva and, and other tantric traditions, ranging from uh, the most uh, developed philosophical and exegetical traditions of Kashmir to the, the real nitty-gritty of, of tantric ritual, and also through examining uh, epigraphical, uh, 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 epigraphic records of the tantric traditions in India, he has overturned uh, the sort of received history of, of Indian religion and shown how from approximately 500 AD to 1300 AD, Shaivism was the dominant religion in India. Uh, and in so doing, he has also made it possible to demonstrate, his work is not only on epigraphy, but also is focused very closely on uh, textual studies, mainly of texts that are yet to be published, that exist only in, in manuscripts. And by examining these, these texts and comparing them with the texts of other traditions, he has shown how these Shaiva tantric traditions influenced uh, Buddhism, uh, the Vaishnava uh, religious uh, traditions in India, and also Jainism. And I think that's what we're going to hear about today in his lecture, which is entitled uh, the, the Jaina Appropriation and Adaptation of Shaiva Ritual, the case of Padlip Tasuri's Nirvana Kalika. Uh, and through reading the handout, which I, I, hope, uh, I hope you've all got copies of, it, it's apparent to me he's going to start by showing us, just uh, giving us an overview of these tantric traditions, and then will demonstrate how this uh, Jaina ritual manual borrowed directly from a Shaiva text, probably a century earlier than it, from the 11th century, called the Siddhanta Sara Padhati. Uh, so over to you, Alexis. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. It's particularly nice to be introduced by a former pupil. Um, I feel very insecure standing here in front of many experts in Jainism, people far more learned in the subject than I am. My acquaintance with Jainism is very indirect and shallow and imperfect. I did study Prakrit as an undergraduate, um, but that was largely self-taught um, unreliable and didn't involve the reading of very much literature, Uttara Jaina Sutta, the Kalpa Sutra, and a few other works. But I think I must confess right now that I'm guilty, like many Indologists, of underestimating the importance of the Jaina tradition. And I think it's only in the last five years or so that I began to realize that while life remains, I really must try to do something about this and uh, take into consideration uh, this enormous literature produced by Jains over the centuries. Of course, my concern with it is primarily to see how it relates to developments in the sphere of Shaiva religion. Um, and in my work, The Shaiva Age, I did touch on the Jaina side, but not in any great depth. Um, and that was largely because I wasn't yet aware of a number of textual continuities, which I've subsequently become aware of. 
And in this lecture, I will try to uh, address those, to some extent at least. Um, let me begin by telling you something about Shaivism. Um, I probably know more about Shaivism than most of you, just as you probably know more about Jainism than I do. Um, so let me begin by saying something about this religion, which in my uh, view had such an impact on the early medieval world in India. The earliest evidence that we have of Shaivism begins in the second century BC, and it should be pointed out immediately that this is not evidence of any of the systematic initiatory traditions which we know from later times. It's simply evidence of lay involvement in Shaivism of some kind or other. That this lay involvement was widespread in India is clear from both Jain and Buddhist donatory inscriptions. These, of course, are largely made by, uh, these donations are largely made by lay people who, have to, of course, do not have ordination names. And we can see from their names, the names of these ordinary Indians of the time, that names, the theophoric names incorporating the name of Shiva predominate. So already in this early period from the second century BC through to the fourth century AD, in this mass of small donative inscriptions that we have, Buddhist and Jain, we can see that Shaivism, faith in Shiva of, of some kind or other, uh, is very widespread. But we have yet to find any evidence of the initiatory traditions which we um, can see in great abundance in later centuries. The first concrete evidence of the uh, Shaiva initiatory traditions comes to us in the fourth century in the form of inscriptions. We have an inscription from Matura, uh, a pillar inscription, which refers to what is clearly a Pashupata lineage, um, which also refers to the recipients, the, the, the donors mentioned in the inscription, as part of, a, of a, uh, a lineage which goes back, if we assign roughly a period of 20 years to each scholarly generation, might take us back to the second century AD. But the first evidence that we have is actually dated in the fourth century of a lineage that's been around for some time. Now, I've just called this group the Pashupata, or the Pashupata. So I should begin by distinguishing, I should go on at this point to distinguish between the two great divisions of the Shaiva tradition which the Shaivas themselves in later uh, times referred to as the Ati Marga and the Mantra Marga, respectively. The Mantra Marga corresponds roughly to most of the territory of what we would, others might call Tantric Shaivism. The Ati Marga refers to a group of highly ascetic traditions um, which um, flourished beginning in this, uh, the, as I said, the earliest evidence in the fourth century, perhaps going back to the second century. Uh, these are radically ascetic groups which in their first form, that testified in the, in the Pashupata Sutra, uh, teaches a form of um, uh, pure asceticism of a very radical kind involving complete disengagement from the mundane world uh, with an enormously strong emphasis upon nonviolence, which I think is one of many evidences in this early tradition of influence, in fact, from the Jaina tradition. This system seems to have developed in Western India uh, and, may, and therefore is in a good position to be influenced by the long-established traditions of Jain asceticism. I call this tradition Atimarga I. Excuse the numbers, but it's convenient. With Atimarga II, which was in place um, by about the fifth century, I think, we see a profound transformation. The form of asceticism becomes even more radical, involving rather shocking transgression of, of the norms of Brahmanical uh, conduct, um, begging with a human skull, um, carrying as a banner, a staff with a human head, a human skull upon it, a living in cremation grounds, and other um, practices which indicate an utter indifference to mundane Brahmanical values, and an utter indifference to laukik or dharma, in fact, mundane, mundane religion. By the fifth century also, we have um, what I call Atimarga III. Now, this really is, uh, is the first uh, stage of a major move towards what will later be called tantric Shaivism. Because here in Atimarga III, which is otherwise known as the Karpalika tradition, or the tradition of the Soma Siddhanta, we see a fusion of the earlier Atimarga II with a new and very different cult of wild goddesses, particularly the goddess Chamunda, and the equally ferocious male deity Bhairava. And this really is the eruption into the Shaiva tradition of a Shakta dim dimension, which is of a very different kind. Uh, initiation is accomplished through uh, possession um, rather than asceticism, 
Um, the whole, uh, the, uh, the, the practices are highly antinomian, involve the consumption of meat, alcohol, and so forth. But at this stage, and we're dealing with the 5th century, these are our earliest references to them in the 5th century, at this stage, uh, we can't yet speak of tantric Shaivism exactly, that is to say, we cannot, ex cannot speak of the mantra marga. What happens in the mantra marga is um, a rather profound change in some respects, the texts of the Mantra Marga begin to emerge in the 5th century again. The earliest texts that we have, which we're, um, working, we've just uh, been uh, publishing, um, the uh, Nishwasa, the earliest level of the Nishwasa corpus, um, we date to around 450 to 550 AD. So this is the earliest uh, evidence we have of uh, Tantric Shaivism. Now what characterizes this new movement is that it's accessible not only to ascetics, but also to married men. So this is a very um, uh, major departure. Up to this point, it's been restricted entirely to ascetics. No doubt they were supported by uh, lay devotees, and we do have a literature of lay devotion as well, which was going along at the same time. But now for the first time, it became possible for married persons to become initiated into the cult and to uh, aspire to the same goal as ascetics, namely liberation from the cycle of rebirth. And this was to be accomplished not through ascetic exercises, but through ritual. This was the extraordinary claim made by the Mantra Marga. Uh, the claim was that Shiva, acting through his consecrated officiants, through his acharyas, could actually destroy the bonds of the soul in advance. The destruction of the bonds of the soul would not be immediately manifest. One would continue to be the same difficult and awkward customer one always had been. But at the time of death, the... Uh, uh, a perfect and complete liberation would ensue. The idea was that the purification was happening at a subliminal level. Now this, uh, this new kind of religion, which obviously was very appealing in many respects, um, was not slow to attract the attention of royalty, or rather they were not slow to attract the attention of royalty to themselves, and they quickly developed a, a form of initiation specifically for kings which involved offering them the entire benefit of initiation without any of the inconveniences, the inconveniences being post-initiatory ritual duties, which would be the downside of, uh, the, of initiation. Um, when you become a tantric initiate, you don't um, enter a world of less ritual, you enter a world of more ritual. Tantric rituals are added to your already uh, active Brahmanical obligations. Kings, however, well, promised the benefit of initiation without any of the inconvenience, the idea being that their ritual, their, their, their duties to society precluded their engagement in uh, full-time uh, uh, religious life. The only requirement was that they should continue as they would have done as lay shivers to support the religion uh, through generous endowment. Now this mantra marga tradition um, bifurcated quite early into two uh, major uh, branches. One, relatively conservative in appearance, relatively congruent with the Brahmanical world, referred to itself uh, eventually as the Siddhanta, the, uh, the, the, the fixed view, the established doctrine, and its followers and practices can therefore be called Siddhantika, that is the, the, the term that we find in the texts. This particular form of tantric ritual, um, offering uh, liberation through initiation, um, does not depart in any dramatic way from the norms of Brahmanical notions of purity and impurity. And it also engages itself much more than the other forms of the tantric tradition in the public domain. It is this tradition which is uh, turned to for the uh, procedures for the initiating, for the uh, consecration of images, of lingas, the consecration of shrines, and so forth. So, this form of religion is much more publicly conspicuous, although it is also, at the same time, a religion of private uh, practice. Beside this Siddhantic tradition, we have a range of cults which remind us very strongly of Atimarga III, since they're focused on Bhairava and various ferocious goddesses of the Chamunda kind. But they have, as it were, this tradition that we see in Atimarga III has now been upgraded by the introduction of new doctrinal developments, which, are, which were introduced by the, uh, the Saidantika Mantra Marga. In addition to these two, the Ati Marga and the Mantra Marga, we have a third Marga, known as the Kula Marga, sometimes simply called Shakta. The Kula Marga goes directly back to Ati Marga III. Um, it is 
the Atimarga III in a kind of intensified and pure form, and focuses almost entirely upon female uh, deities, uh, particularly the goddesses Kuleshwari, Kubjika, uh, Kalasankarshini, or Kali, and eventually in a later development, and a very successful development, the goddess Tripura, or Tripura Sundari. Now, I have to keep this very brief, but let me just point out that the big uh, fault line there, the big change within that range of goddesses is between uh, the earlier deities, Kubjika, Kalasankarshini, Kuleshwari, and so forth, on the one hand, and Tripura Sundari on the other. The cult of Tripura Sundari does not emerge out of the Atimarga III environment, although there are elements of that which have been taken in. And rather, um, and the, the reason I say that is that it's a form of Shakta worship which um, has freed itself completely of the rather gruesome uh, association with the culture of the cremation grounds, which remains very predominant in the other forms of the Kolimarga and in the non Saidantika uh, Mantra Marga. So because of this, I think, because the goddess Tripura Sundri is mild, a beautiful deity, uh, the cult does not uh, require the um, performance in, <coughs> of, a, of an extraordinary uh, or transgressive kind. For this reason, it became extremely popular in India and indeed survives down to the present, although for the most part it does so in what we might call domesticated variants in which the properly tantric elements, namely the mantras and so forth, have been played down and more Brahmanical practices uh, introduced or overlaying it so that it can be appropriated by the mainstream Brahmanical tradition without um, the challenge to orthodoxy posed by tantric initiation. I should point out that while tantric initiation was offering a huge benefit, it also had a downside, that is to say, the Orthodox were always highly suspicious and naturally of any claim that the Brahmanical religion was not enough, that something in addition was required. So the Shaivas were saying, yes, Brahmanism is fine, but it will not give you liberation. You need to have initiation as well. Once you have it, you must continue to respect the Brahmanical religion. It's the ground floor of a two-floor edifice, as it were. You must respect its rules, but it does not bestow liberation. So th there was this uh, downside. Um, um, and so that, that of course, uh, fueled a process of uh, the constant creation of safe reflexes of these tantric traditions. So if you look in this vast literature we have, it really is huge. Uh, you have to make a distinction, though it isn't a very clear dichotomy sometimes, between properly tantric literature requiring initiation um, and offering access to liberation which is beyond, explicitly beyond that offered by the Brahmanical tradition, and a... Uh, a harmonizing tradition which plays down the doctrinal specificity of the tantric traditions and just presents different forms of worship focusing on new deities within the broader framework of Brahmanical belief and uh, orthopraxy. Now, um, the rise of Shaivism during this period, from, mainly from the fifth, approximately the 5th century on, um, had, as I've uh, argued many times now, uh, a very major impact upon its neighbors. Through the securing, perhaps, of extensive royal patronage, the Siddhanta in particular, the Siddhantic tradition of Shaivism, was able to establish itself in a pan-Indian network of monastic establishments with extraordinary rapidity. In fact, I would say that by the 9th century, this was the only organization in India which could claim a pan-Indian reach. No kingdom could claim that. But the, uh, the acharyas of the Shaiva Saidantika tradition were often in the, in, the, in the role of Rajagurus to a large number of kings, not just one, but several at the same time. They were pope-like figures with an authority extending beyond uh, individual kingdoms. And with this, uh, I mean, what drove this was, of course, Dakshina. The giving of initiation to kings required an appropriate Dakshina proportionate to the wealth of the recipient. And although the early uh, dikshas uh, were rewarded with rather modest quantities of land or revenue from land, uh, once this tradition got underway, some quite extraordinarily large donations were made by various pious kings. And the Saitantikas were not slow to put this money to use by building branch monasteries, installing their disciples as the acharyas in those branch monasteries. And in this way, in no time at all, the tradition spread. So by the 12th century, it really is a pan-Indian network. It also went to Southeast Asia, but it did so uh, particularly into the Cambodian, uh, the area of Cambodia, the Khmer realm, uh, 
Um, but that it, it reached there rather early, I think in the ninth century, um, and there it stayed in a frozen form. The subsequent developments didn't reach Cambodia. So the Cambodian Shaiva tradition, the Sidanika tradition, is, is um, stunted in a sense. It didn't uh, continue to absorb the new developments that were going on in India. But for that very reason, it's of particular interest to me because it, as it were, is a um, sort of frozen in the past, preserving various old Shaiva traditions, uh, which in India were um, gone beyond uh, through the process of, uh, largely a process of simplification of ritual, um, certain very uh, earlier, very elaborate ritual systems did survive in the Khmer Kingdom right down to the 14th century AD. Now, with this spread, this massive investment by kings in Shaivism, um, motivated perhaps not only by their own desire to um, be seen as empowered by, by Shiva, their, their kingdoms, as it were, legitimated and empowered, but also, of course, considering the fact that their tax base was largely Shaiva. I think we should take into consideration that the success of Shaivism is not simply to do with uh, cunning strategies on the parts of its acharyas to, to develop new rituals, um, to bring in uh, royal support. It was also rooted in the fact that it had a very deeply established lay uh, following. So by articulating themselves in Shaiva terms, they were speaking to their, to their subjects. Um, of course, they tended not to be exclusive in so doing. Their tax base included others, including Jains, Buddhists, and so forth. And so on the whole, Indian kings were not exclusive in their largesse. They were obliged to give back what they received, at least to some, to some extent. There isn't much evidence of really fanatic, exclusive Shaivism in this period. There might have been if they'd had the opportunity, but they didn't. The rival traditions were too powerful to be pushed to one side or persecuted. So now, the, the, the evidence of the, the influence, it's of two kinds. The first thing is that certain traditions which in early times seem to have been largely independent of Shaivism were swallowed by it. It colonized them and absorbed them, um, and in so doing, it seems, um, disempowered the original forms. So the cult of Skanda, which I didn't touch on in the, uh, in the Shaiva age. I should have done. I tried to do so in a revised version of it. The cult of Skanda, which originally is rather an independent tradition, gets, as it were, sucked into the Shaiva tradition and leaves little trace outside it. The same is true of the cult of the sun. We know from early sources that there was a tantric saura tradition of worshippers of the sun. Unfortunately, their literature has disappeared. What we have are works... Um, which show the incorporation of this tradition within Shaivism. So Shaivism, as it were, opened up a slot for the Saura worship by making um, it compulsory. This wasn't universal throughout Shaivism, but became quite widely adopted. Uh, made it compulsory that there should be a Surya puja preceding every Shiva puja. And the, uh, the ritual system used for that is originally a Saura tradition, um, it's quite clear there are various Iranian elements in it because the Sarah tradition is originally an Iranian religion. Um, but it seems not to have survived as an independent tradition, but only, as it were, embedded in, in, in the Shaiva tradition. There's also, of course, the, the, the very rich tradition of the worship of goddesses in India. This too, and particularly this, was, as it were, um, incorporated by the Shaivas uh, through the production of a, a, a really rather extraordinarily large body of texts designed to provide Shaiva methods for the propitiation of these goddesses. Now, these goddesses themselves are clearly not Shaiva in origin in all cases. Very often, they have a strongly Vaishnava character in their iconography or associations. So we see that the Shaivas were out there systema systematically bringing in kalpas, ritual systems from other traditions, redacting them inside new texts, the most outstanding of which is the Jayadrata Yamala, an enormous work of some 24,000 verses. Um, part of it produced in Kashmir, but the original work not, I think. The original core of the text not. Um, and here we see a veritable encyclopedia of Kali forms, mainly Kali forms, um, many of which have, in fact, a Vaishnava background. So we see a gradual incorporation of a Shaktism as well. And this Shakta element gets, as it were, its slot within the Shaiva canon, within the non sidantika division, in a collection of texts known as the Vidya Pita, or the Vidya collection, where Vidya stands for mantra, but with the implication that these are female mantras as opposed to male mantras. 
the, the noun mantraha in Sanskrit being masculine, the noun vidya, which is essentially synonymous, being uh, feminine in gender. <coughs> so we see this, uh, as it were, incorporation, absorption of the cults of Surya, Skanda, and the Devi. Now, what about Vaishnavism? Well, I've, amen I've mentioned that some Vaishnava elements were taken up within, within Shaivism, particularly the more antinomian ones. Um, but what remained as to the more transgressive elements of the tradition, um, particularly associated with uh, the cult of the god Narasimha. But um, in mainstream Vaishnavism, we see also a very major impact in the development of the medieval Pancharatra tradition. Now, the Pancharatra is an ancient tradition, at least the name is ancient. It already is found in the Narayaniya of the, of the Mahabharata. But, of course, there's no reason to assume that that Pancharatra is the same as the one that we see in the elaborate treatises that have come down to us uh, in such works as the Jayaka Samhita, the Sattva Samhita, and the Pashkara Samhita. These works, which have often been claimed to be rather old, to be predating the Shaiva uh, texts, in fact, in my view, were not produced before the middle of the 9th century. There are good iconographic reasons for thinking that. Uh, and there are also, um, there's also abundant evidence within these early uh, Pancharatrika tantric scriptures that they were processing Shaiva material and were not doing so perfectly. The consequence of which is that you see, as it were, Shaiva fingerprints on the Vaishnava material, but not Vaishnava fingerprints on the Shaiva material. In other words, uh, the, 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 the Vaishnavas were retooling their system, producing a new ritual system along the lines as we're using Shaiva software, if you like. Um, and in so doing, they occasionally borrowed textual categories or certain ontological categories as well that don't make any sense inside Vaishnavism. But the redactors of the text were not careful enough, not rigorous enough to bother to remove all these traces. So uh, troublemakers like me can come along later and see what's been going on. Traces of the process are left in the finished texts. It's almost as though the texts were produced to order at high speed and the redactors did not have an, a sufficient time to remove the traces of what they were actually up to, which was a, as were adopting materials from another tradition and passing them off as their own. Now, um, Buddhism. <clears throat> the impact of Buddhism is, is really profound. Buddhism completely redesigned itself from the 7th century onwards along tantric lines. And in doing so, it, used, it began in the early phase using Shaiva ideas, and then in the later phase, from the 10th century onwards, by actually incorporating Shaiva textual material and um, taking in uh, Shaiva yoga and various other practices which are completely alien to the early uh, uh, Buddhist tradition. And this I have demonstrated at some length in, in, in my work, the, the Shaiva Age, and there's more to be said on that. Um, when I first started working on that subject, I restricted myself carefully to a corpus of texts known as the Yogini Tantras, which represent the latest and very shakta oriented phase in the development of uh, Buddhist Tantrism. Um, and so when I gave lectures on this subject in Japan and there were Shingon Buddhists in the room, I felt I wasn't going to be treading on any bunions, as it were, because they also consider these later Tantras to be heretical and uh, not pure Tantric uh, Buddhism. But I'm afraid as my research progressed, it became progressively aware, became more and more I became more and more aware of the fact that this Shaiva influence goes back to precisely the sources which are the sources of the Shingon tradition in Japan. That is to say, the tantras known as the Charya Tantra and the Yoga Tantra, which although they do not involve the absorption and rewriting of uh, uh, Shaiva material, are nonetheless inspired by Shaiva religious practice, particularly through the practice of initiation into mandalas, the practice of recruiting people by... Um, creating powder mandalas on the ground in which the deities are summoned and installed, then bringing initiates, initiates before these mandalas, blindfolded, removing the blindfold and exposing them to the power of the deities. Uh, the, the, the Buddhists adopted this Shaiva practice on a grand scale, whereas the Shaiva said, you may initiate three, up to three at a time, the Buddhists really opened the floodgates and allowed mass initiations. In fact, the earliest text to expound uh, tantric initiation in detail in the Buddhist tradition says there should be no paricca. There are no tests, no test needs to be applied for initiation. Anyone who wants it can have it, particularly the followers of other religions. Clearly it's a powerful conversion uh, tool and it was used uh, not only in India but of course also in Inner Asia and the Far East as a way of recruiting people into the faith. 
So the impact on, on, on uh, Tantric Buddhism, or Mantranaya, as one should perhaps call it, was really profound. Now, when I wrote The Shaiva Age, I did actually have a small section on Jainism, but I'm afraid I hadn't done anything like sufficient research on that topic. Since then, I've done a little bit more, and I hope in future years to do it a bit more deeply. But let me tell you briefly what I have uh, discovered so far. So in your item five of the introduction, you have the heading Jainism, and under that, I have put, uh, I think, four items, numbered A through to D. Now, this is not exhaustive. Um, it's more exemplary. And I've chosen these because they, they, they demonstrate different aspects of the, the way that uh, Jains in the early medieval period took in and transformed and utilized for their own spiritual purpose practices which were developed originally outside the Jain world. Now, the first work that I want to draw attention to is the, the great Yoga Shastra of Hema Chandra, the great uh, Kali Yuga Sarvagya, Kali Kala Sarvagya, the omniscient one of our present degenerate age, who died in 1172 AD. Now, this work, which he says was composed for the Chalukya king of the region of Gujarat, Kumara Pala, is profoundly influenced by Shaivism um, in many respects. The first thing is that it teaches a tantric yoga for liberation. Now, I can't go into this in any detail here, but if people are interested to see the, the data, or some of the data at least, that can be presented to this effect, um, a handout that I produced for a lecture on this topic in, in Hamburg in 2011 is available online, and I think I've given the reference to it in fact, you can get it by going to my page on academia.edu, and you can see that I've put forward quite a lot of material there from the, um, the uh, Yoga Shastra to show how uh, a new system of tantric yoga involving visualization um, uh, of uh, the form of the deity and also the, the letter forms, the mantras of the deity, for the attainment not of supernatural powers, but of liberation itself. It's often said that Jainism utilized tantric methods, adopted tantric practices, but for mundane purposes, not for the final goal of liberation. That was exclusively uh, accessible through the, the, the ancient tradition of purification through the Jain ascetic discipline. But here in the uh, Yoga Shastra, we see a very different mentality coming through, and it's one that to me is entirely familiar because it permeates Shaiva literature as well. So you have this well-known classification of uh, meditation practices following the kaula or kulamara classification into pindasta, uh, padasta, rupasta, and rupatita. And if you look, I've put some of the passages on the earlier handout. Um, I have actually a few of them with me. If anyone would like to ask me for one afterwards, I can, I can give the few I have out. Uh, you will see that uh, this is really those who understand the Shaiva meditation traditions will see that this is the source of it. This is, has no antecedent inside Jainism. Furthermore, um, he culminates his account of the, the Jain uh, path to liberation, and the Jain discipline, the Jain yoga, with a text which is quite clearly, as the, the, the great uh, Jambu Vijayamuni pointed out, um, a paraphrase or a rewrite of a well-known Shaiva meditation text known as the Amanaska Yoga, an authority on that text is sitting in the second row. So this is, um, uh, again, uh, uh, the idea that one can attain liberation by emptying the mind and plunging into a state free of discursive elaboration. Um, this is familiar to the, to, to the world of Shaivas, but I think rather not what um, the early promulgators of Jainism had in mind. So in this respect, the, um, the Yoga Shastra uh, shows us a world that is radically transformed, not on the level of ritual, we'll come to that later, but on the level of inner spiritual discipline. The goal aspired to is a Jaina goal, but the methods that have been used to reach this goal are now very different. So the purpose is the same, but the methods are now different. Now, the second item I've put down on my list there is shakta, and I've used inverted commas there, uh, shakta kalpa, that is to say, shakta ritual systems. Um, and two famous works are there, the Jvalani Malani, the, the Jvala Malani Kalpa and the Padmavati Kalpa, or Bhairava Padmavati Kalpa. Um, these are uh, extremely important 
texts. And their textual source is quite easy to, to, to locate. The, it's not that these texts have simply taken chunks of Shakta Shaiva literature and passed them off as Jain by changing the names. It's not like that. Um, but the repertoire of mantras and practices is drawn from the Shakta cult of Tripura Sundari. If you look at the earlier handout, you'll see the rather concrete evidence of that. The mantras come from the cult of Tripura Sundari. And they've been creatively re re reorganized and slightly modified to individualize them to serve a Jain purpose. Now, in these texts, the purpose is not liberation. The purpose is the accomplishment of various uh, laukika or mundane goals. So here in this domain of Shakta worship, uh, drawing on the non sidantika Shaiva tradition and its Kala extension, we are not dealing with liberationist practice, but with practice for the accomplishment of Siddhi or supernatural effects. The full repertoire of uh, supernatural effects offered by the Shaivas in their own ritual system, but with a much stronger emphasis on non-violence. As you know, the Shaivas are not too fussy about non-violence, especially non-sacrificial violence. Um, there's no trace of that here. There are hostile mantras, there are uh, martial mantras, mantras for use in war, because after all, there were giant kingdoms in abundance in Karnataka. Um, but they, the, the, the emphasis is upon um, somehow weakening the will of the opponent rather than actually killing him outright. So there's a giant emphasis upon nonviolence is preserved in, in these traditions, even though um, they include hostile magic. The third element I've uh, given, which I haven't explored in sufficient detail, um, is, the t is the presence of tantric elements in Jain samskaras, that is to say, in the Jain's development of rituals for the life cycle rites of, uh, of uh, Jain lay people. Now, I'm sure one could do a great deal of research on this, much more than I have done. What I've done is read the Archara Dinakara of Vardhamana Suri, a work composed in the early 15th century in the north of India around Jalandhar. And uh, here it is very clear that um, these rituals are permeated by um, a, a mantra pantheon drawn from tantric sources. Now, finally, we come to the element which is the main part of this talk, uh, and that is the impact of Siddhantika ritual on Jainism. Now, so far we've been talking about uh, Shaiva Yoga influencing the Yoga Shastra and Shakta uh, supernaturalist practice influencing the development of Jain Kalpas in the 10th century and afterwards. Um, now we're looking at a very different phenomenon, that is the development of a Jain equivalent to the rituals for the installation of deities in temples which had been developed by the Sidantikas. Now, I think, I, I know, it was in fact Paul Dundas who's in this room, who um, I think in the article on the Parnamiyaka uh, tradition um, pointed out that the Nirvana Kalika looks like, um, teaches a system of ritual which is highly reminiscent of what we find in such Shaiva ritual padatis as the Soma Shambhu Padati. He was absolutely right, it, it is exactly as he says, but what I'm going to do here is to actually say which Shaiva Padati it was and to show you um, how, uh, show you some textual evidence to that, to that effect. Um, the Nirvana Kalika um, was the work of uh, a Jain Suri called Padalipta, Padalipta Suri. His name actually is in various forms, Padlipta, Palitta, Palipta. It occurs in many different variants. Um, and what it does is set out in simple prose tantric procedures to be followed by Jainas in regular worship, daily worship, the worship of initiates, uh, daily worship. By initiates, I do not mean uh, mendicants, not Jain Diksha in that sense, but Tantric Diksha. So procedures for regular worship, Nitya Karma, initiation, Diksha, and the consecration of Acharyas, Acharya Abhisheka. The penances prescribed for initiates who infringe the rules of their discipline, Prayaschitam. And in great detail, the ceremonies for the installation of images, Pratishta, and the consecration of temples. Now, I've put on that handout on page two, just after the paragraph I've just read to you, a citation from the Padalipta Acharya Prabandha, the hagiography of uh, the Acharya Padalipta, uh, 
found in the Prabhavaka Charita of Prabhachandra Acharya, composed in the 13th century. Um, and I went, yeah, here it is. Shravakanam yati namcha pratishta dikshaya saha utapana pratishta rahad bimbanam jusadamapi yadukta vidito budva vidhi yetatra suribi nirvana kalika shastram prabhush chakre kripavashat. Out of compassion, kripavashat, the master, Padalipta, composed the Shastra Nirvana Kalika, following whose injunctions Suris can understand and perform in this world installation, Pratishta, together with the initiation, Diksha, of lay persons and Yatis. Installation, that is to say, the setting up of images of the Arhats and gods. Now, this text is based on, indeed, it's a creative uh, uh, redaction of a surviving Siddhantika Shaiva ritual manual, uh, as uh, Jim Mallinson has already pointed out, the Siddhanta Sara Padati of Maharaja Adi Raja Bhojadeva. I'm sorry, there's a typo on your page. He's said to have lived from 000 to 1050, to have ruled rather from 000 to 1055. Read. Uh, 1000 to 1055. And this text, which is not published, um, although I and other people working in this field have been looking at it for some time, uh, has reached us through two early palm leaf manuscripts which are preserved in the Kathmandu Valley. And at the top of page three, you see the details of those two um, texts. And you can see that they really are very old. The earliest of them was completed in 1066 to 1067 AD, and the other is only slightly later, 1111 to 12 AD. And you'll see that I, I give there the final colophon, and in the first, under A, the last verse as well, which explicitly attributes this work to Borjadeva, King Borjadeva, and the colophon, which of course is not evidential in itself, because colophons can be easily modified and added, um, likewise attributes it, as in other works attributed to Borjadeva, attributes it to Maharaja Adi Raja Shri Bhova Virachitayam Siddhanta Sara Padatau, and so forth. This is a formula we find at the end of all his works, in fact, all the works attributed to him, as far as I can recall. He's always given the title Maharaja Adi Raja, which also appears in his inscriptions. Now, the Nirvana Kalika is essentially the Siddhanta Sara Padati, modified by rewording and omission to remove intractably Shaiva elements. Sometimes it's very superficial. Shiva Gaya, by command of Shiva, becomes Jina Gaya, by the command of the Jina. Sometimes very superficial doctrine of the text. But the redactor was no fool. He occasionally realizes that there's material which is completely intractable. He simply deletes it, uh, reorganizes, and sometimes adds original material of his own. But nonetheless, the text follows wherever it can the exact words of the Shaiva original. So the Shaiva text is the matrix, which has simply been re-edited to produce uh, a giant work. Um, nonetheless, in spite of its Sh Shaiva matrix, its author is not going to declare that fact, uh, of course. Uh, he declares in his opening verse, rather disingenuously, I think, that the work has been extracted from the Jinagama. Well, I don't know what to make of that, but it doesn't seem to be quite accurate. Um, yeah. So now, what date is this text? How old is it? Now, the earliest attributed citation of the Nirvana Kalika is in, to my knowledge, 1191. Of course, my knowledge is not very profound in these areas, and I've, if someone can come up with an earlier citation, I'd be very happy to hear it. Uh, is in, in Siddha Sena Suri's commentary on the Pravachana Sarodhara of Nemi Chandra Suri. Uh, he, in fact, refers to the last section of the Nirvana Kalika, mentioning the text by name, for its account of the uh, Yakshadevis, the iconography of the Yakshadevis, which occurs as an appendix to this Nirvana Kalika. Um, having said that uh, it simply follows the Shaiva text, I should add, I have well, mentioned briefly, but I'll elaborate slightly, it is also creative. It does add new giant material. Particularly, of course, it has a different pantheon of, of worship. It doesn't just take over the Shaiva pantheon of worship. 
It takes over a five-faced, it introduces a central deity, a four-faced Parameshtin, uh, surrounded by the Dikkumaris and so forth. Um, and so inevitably its treatment of regular ritual, although it uses the Shaiva text wherever it can, has to depart from it when it actually sets out the details of which mantras are to be used with which deities in the order of, uh, of uh, procedure. But as soon as it can, it gets back to its source. So there's a principle of inertia here. He never writes where he doesn't, where he, never, he never composes where he doesn't have to. Wherever he can, he stays with his Shaiva prototype. Um, and when you do as I have done, um, prepare, uh, when you prepare a, a, an edition of the text, uh, in the two texts side by side, um, let us say, the way I did it, you, you, I have my, my own, in my computer, my edition of the Siddhanta Sara Padati. You take a chunk of that and put it in your, in, in, on one side of the page, and then um, modify that to produce the uh, giant version by looking at the printed edition, so you then have the two side by side. So by doing that, each time one makes a change, one is going through exactly the mental process that the redactor himself went through as he produced his giant text from the Shaiva. And sometimes one thinks, oh, that was clever. Sometimes one thinks, that was rather superficial, a little bit too facile. You know, one actually sees his mind at work. It's not often um, that in studying remote periods like this, one can get right into the shoes, as it were, uh, the slippers of the, of, of the redactor. But on this occasion, it really is possible. And one sees a mind that is sometimes intelligent, sometimes rather not, in, not, not so intelligent. One sees, in fact, a human being at work. Um, So we can say that um, the Nirvana Kalika must have been composed um, before the uh, commentary of Siddha Sena Suri, composed in 1191 AD, and after the Siddhanta Sarapadati, which it is clearly utilizing. Um, as I've said, the Siddhanta Sarapadati says in its closing verse and in its colophons that it is the work of Maharaja Raja Bhojadeva, the Emperor of Malwa. His rule occupies most of the first half of the 11th century. You have a footnote finessing that slightly, but it doesn't really alter the matter. A terminus antequem is provided by the date of the Kriya Kandakramavali of Soma Shambhu. Because the Siddhanta Sara Padati was the model for that better known work. That being in large part, as I've shown elsewhere, a versification of the prose of the Siddhanta Sara Padati. Now, the Nepalese, Indian, South Indian, and Kashmirian manuscripts of this popular text, the Kriya Khanda Kramavali, differ, unfortunately, on the date of its composition. They have a verse towards the end of the work in which they state the date, but there are different versions of this verse. But one of them I find much more trustworthy than the others, for reasons I can't elaborate on now. Uh, put it this way, that it, uh, this seems to have been, uh, this version seems to have come directly from the place where the text was produced at the time of the production of the text. Uh, the region was uh, the region of Gurgi uh, in Rewa in central India, under the Kalachuri kings. Now, this date, which is earlier than in the others that have been found, uh, gives a completion date of 1048 to 49. So we can say that the Siddhanta Sara Padati was composed at some time before AD 1048 to 9, no doubt during the reign of Borjadeva, even if we are suspicious of the claim that the work was by the king himself. I mean, so many works are attributed to Borjadeva, one wonders whether they're not really the products of his court and his obedient pundits who produced them, rather than actually from his pen. We can't be sure. At least we, there's room for doubt. But I think the attribution to the reign is, is plausible even if it wasn't his pen that uh, put words to palm leaf. Um, now, is there any evidence within the giant literature itself to support this rather late dating of the text? As no doubt many of you know, uh, giant hagiography um, treats Padlipta as a very ancient figure, associating him with a King Murunda, who is sometimes uh, associated by Western scholars with the Kushana period. He's also said to get into magic context with with Nagarjuna and I think with Kaputacharya. So he's presented as a very ancient figure. That's what we see in the Prabhavaka Charita, 
But as we've already seen, he also knows that this, this, uh, this author was the author of the uh, Dirvana Kalika. Well, um, we do have uh, the closing prashasti of the Nirvana Kalika. And there we are told that the author was the disciple of the Vachanacharya Mandana Gani, who was himself a disciple of Sangama Singha, who was described as leader of the Shvetambaras and ornament of the Vidyagara, Vidyadara Kula, or if you like, Vidyadara Vamsha. Now, according to Daki, in a Gujarati article of, 2000, of the year 2000, the Sangama Singha, who was the teacher of this Padalipta's teacher, is the Sangama Siddha of the Vidyadara Kula, who died through Salekana on Mount Shatrunjaya in 1008 AD. According to the Pundarika Swamin pedestal inscription of that year, this date is consistent with the requirement that his pupil's pupil, the author of the Nirvana Kalika, post-date the composition of the Siddhanta Sara Padati. So I think it's very clear on many grounds that we're looking at um, an 11th century work here. Now in the rest of your handout, what I've put in front of you is a parallel edition of parts of this text with the prototype the, um, from the Siddhanta Sara, the Siddhanta Sara Padati on the left, and the giant rewritten version on the right. The Shaiva version, the Siddhanta Sara, is based upon two manuscripts, which I've called A and B, and the numbers following the, the letters are the folio numbers in question. Now, it's obviously not possible to go through this in any detail, but I'll try to pick up some points. Before doing that, I should point out that the earlier handout, which is available online, gives much more text covering completely the the sections on regular worship and initiation. So that bit I'm not touching today. I'm moving on to Pratishta. And before I do that, I should say that this doesn't cover the whole of Pratishta by any means. That's the main subject matter of the text. And in fact, it does not cover the main part of Pratishta in the text, which is called the Bimba Pratishta Vidhi. And there the text departs from the Shaiva prototype, following... Um, partly because its pantheon is entirely different, of course, but also uh, citing uh, Prakrit verses, many of which are found in the Panchashaka Prakaranam attributed to A. Haribhadra. Um, so here, the, the core initiation, the core ritual of, of insulation deviates in the larger section of the text, but the frame around it, the rituals, for example, for uh, examining the site, adopting the site for the construction of a temple, uh, for laying down the initial, um, uh, the first stones that act as it were as the base, the so-called padas, the feet of the temple. Um, and then uh, I've also included uh, the ritual of um, uh, Dvara Pratishta, the insulation of deities in the doors. And uh, finally, um, I've included the Hrit Pratishta, the insulation of the heart, which is in fact a kind of animation ritual in which life is given to the temple. So I've, I've given you sections from those, not the complete text in all cases, but enough there to make the point, I think. Um, you'll see on the first page, page five, that the texts are virtually identical. This is the beginning in which the Acharya is supposed to examine the ground to see whether it's suitable for the, for the Yajamana who wishes to found the, found the temple according to his caste and so forth. Now I've marked in bold characters the, the, the significant deviations in the, the giant version. And you'll see that there are only two on that page. In the first case, uh, about two-thirds of the way down, you'll see on the Shaiva side, tat purushadi mantrasam pujitam asne hantam prajvalat yari pashit. This is a, a prognosticatory rite um, to work out whether the earth is suitable for a person of a certain caste by lighting lamps, a number of lamps, and seeing how many of them go out. Um, the important thing is that in the Shaiva case, the uh, lamp is worshipped with the mantras of Tat Purusha, etc. These are the five Brahma mantras of the Shaiva tradition, corresponding to the five faces of Sadashiva Tat Purusha, Aghora, Vamadeva, Sadyojata, and Ishana. Now, that of course was immediately recognized by the giant redactor as inappropriate for a, a giant text, so he instead, instead substitutes. The Anga mantras, also as a, as a concept adopted from Shaiva Mantra Shastra, each Mula mantra has Anga mantras, each root mantra has auxiliary or ancillary mantras, 
So likewise, the Jain tradition adopted this system of angas, six angas mm -hmm. with the Mula Mantra. Mm -hmm. So he says, Hridayadi. The mantra is beginning with Hridaya. The heart anga is the first of those angas. So he's, as it were, diffused the Shaiva element there by substituting something neutral. A bit further down the text, you will see on the Shaiva side, in bold characters, Agora Strena. So, um, Dvarapala Pujadi Mantra Tarpanantam Karma Kritva, Agora Strena Sahasram Hutva, Kumba Panchakam Saptadanyanam Upari, and so forth. Having, um, having first completed the ritual, ending with the gratification of the mantras, uh, and the uh, beginning with the puja of the uh, door guardians and uh, ending with the gratification of the mantras. Um, he should then make 1,000 oblations into fire, reciting the Agorastra, the weapon mantra of Agora. This is a specific Shaiva mantra that, of course, won't work in the Jaina context. So the Jaina redactor simply translates, uh, substitutes Mula Mantrena with the root mantra, thereby uh, diffusing the Shaiva content. On the next page, as this ritual proceeds, we come to a point in which a pot covered with two cloths is to be placed on the, th on the shoulder of uh, a Brahmin. This is to do with making the boundary. In the, in the Vaishnava case, the word, sorry, excuse me, in the Jaina case, the word Brahmanasya, skande vidaya, nidaya, sorry, having placed it on the, sh on the shoulder of a Brahmin, instead of that we have indrasya skande nidaya, having placed it on the shoulder of the Indra, and the Indra, Indra, as everyone in Jainism knows, is not the god Indra here, but the Yajamana, the patron of the, of, of the sacrifice of this uh, Pratishta. So that's adapted. Um, a bit further down, uh, there was a rather interesting um, piece of mumbo-jumbo, which was, <laughs> I try not to waste too much of my life on mumbo-jumbo, but it is difficult sometimes. Um, you see on the Shaiva case, Vakachata eha shapa yair navabir varnai prashnagatair var shalyam janiyat. This is a prognosticatory procedure for detecting the presence of invisible shalyas, um, impure or dangerous things buried in the soil which should be removed before the, uh, the building of the temple proceeds. And this involves making a grid uh, and putting these letters in, 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 in the boxes within the grid as a prognosticatory procedure based upon that. And these are indeed the letters in the Shaiva case. Um, I think the way it works, there is a brief account of this in Ellen Brunet's uh, uh, detailed commentary on the Soma Shambhu Padati, citing relevant sources from South India. It's to do with um, what words the Jyotisha, the uh, astronomer, uses when he uh, interrogates you. So if it, if it starts with one of these letters, that indicates a Shalya in this direction and so forth. So it's kind of prognostication from the prashna, the interrogations. Notice on the, on the, Vaishna, on the uh, Jaina side, the redactor was puzzled by this, as I was indeed when I saw this. When I saw vakachata eha shapayair, I thought, hmm, this looks like gibberish. Uh, the Shaiva manuscripts have corrupted it. And I looked over to the Jain case, and I saw a nice, neat kachatata Saha, you know, these are letters that have some kind of order to them, the classes of the sounds. But in fact, I think what happened is that we know from other Shaiva sources that the mumbo jumbo is real. Those are indeed the letters to be put in the grid. And that the Jain redactor, unfamiliar with that, substitutes a more rational arrangement. No doubt it worked just as well. Um, yeah, anyway, apart from that, you'll see the texts are essentially identical. On page 7, in the Pada Pratishta, this ritual for the installation of the, uh, the, the stones, the original um, shila, uh, bricks or, or stones that form the base of the temple, which are ritually put in holes uh, at the beginning of the whole procedure. Um, if you look at the top of page 7, on the Shaiva side, Tata prayashita ho vidaya, shila kumbangsha daya, prasadam gatwa, gartas wa adhara shaktim datwa, o manantaya nama iti, kumbam vinyasya, and so forth. Then having performed a, um, a reparatory fire sacrifice to eliminate any mistakes, the consequences of any mistakes in the ritual up to this point, so prayashita ho man vidaya, shila ha kumbangsha daya, taking up the stones and the pots, you need both for this ritual, and having proceeded to the temple, prasadam gatva, 
and having installed Datwa, the Adara Shakti, the power of the cosmic support, Adara Shakti, inside the holes which have been prepared for these stones, he should then place the Kumba in the central hole, the pot in the central hole, with the mantra, O Manantaya Nama, O Obeisance to Ananta. Ananta is the typical Shaiva throne deity in the construction of the throne. Ananta Bhattaraka is installed here. Now, of course, that won't work in the Jain case. It's too obviously Shaiva. So we have a slightly uh, condensed version. Tatashila Kumbang Shadaya, then having taken up the stones and the pots, and having proceeded to the place of the temple, Prasadastana Magatya, why did he change Prasadam to Prasadastanam? I think there was no reason for doing so. It may well be that he saw this variant in his manuscript of the text, and that our two manuscripts are the deviant ones here of the Shaiva prototype. Um, and then, having placed the Kumba, Kumbam Vinyasya, Madhyamagartayam, in the central hole, with the mantra Om Arham Jinaya Nama, a nice standard Jain mantra. And what about this Adara Shakti? That's not Jaina. So we have Siddha Shakti, the power of the Siddhas, is installed in the place of that. But you can see that the mind is doing, the, who, it's hard to know how creative this is. Is he inventing these things as he goes on? Or is he drawing on um, uh, tradition which is now lost to view? It's possible. But I have a feeling that um, either he or his predecessor was looking at the parallel, as it were, and substituting Siddha Shakti as the nearest thing he could think of for Adara Shakti. We want the Shakti, but a Shakti of what? We can't have the Adara Shakti. How about Siddhanam Shakti, the power of the Siddhas? Um, so having done that, Lagnakale Budhyantadva Padavyapti Sanchintya, having visualized it as pervading the entire universe up to the level of Buddhi, I beginning with earth up to Buddhi, the Sankhya Tattvas up to Buddhi. Lagnakale at the appropriate moment for proceeding, astronomically determined astrologically determined appropriate moment for proceeding. Um, uh, and having pronounced Ucharya, the mantra, Om Haum Shivaya Swaha, this is classic Siddhantika root mantra. This is the Mula mantra of the, uh, the Siddhantika tradition with the substitution of Swaha for Nama because uh, this is treated as it were as a Huma. Um, so having uh, uttered that, he should then Namaskarena Shilam Vinyaset. He should then place uh, the stone on it using the Namaskara the Namaskara Mantra. So, in the Jain case, we have a uh, slight variation. Lagnakale Siddha Shaktim Vinyasya Sanchintya Om Ram Jinaya Swaheti Mantra Mucharya Namaskarena Shilam Naveshayet. What are the chances of these two texts being written in exactly the same form by coincidence? I think it's impossible. Yeah. And then we have uh, the mantras of the, the directions, the laws of the directions, the lokapalas or the dikpalas, the same in both the Shaiva and the, Vaish and, uh, Shaiva and the Jaina case. No need to change those. We have Om Lum Indraya on both sides of the, of the text and so forth. But one difference, the Jain the, uh, the Jain system uses 10 lokapalas. It must have uh, Brahman for above and Dharanendra for below, Naga. So here we, the redactor adds Om Nagaya Nama, Om Brahmane Nama to conclude the list of 10 Lokeshas or Lokapalas. So Iti Lokesha Mantrais, Tam Ramaya Kumban and so forth. It goes on exactly the same. And then at the end, um, we have some additional Shaiva material which he doesn't want to use. So he draws it to a, a premature close, if you like. Um, so having installed, going down a bit to the words um, Dharmadi Chetushkam, Dharmadi Chetushkam Chashila Nam Adishtayaka Tvena Vinyasya, having installed the five beginning with Dharma, Dharma, Jnana, Vairagya, and Aishwarya, and the four, sorry, the four, excuse me, the four beginning with Dharma, Dharma, Jnana, uh, Vairagya, and Aishwarya, and the four beginning with their opposites, Adharma, um, Adharma, Ajnana, and Aishwarya, and Avairagya as the forces that preside over those stones, Shilana Marishtayaka Tvena Vinyasya, he should then perform a elaborate puja, Visheshata Pujam Vidaya, that normally means in the Shaiva case, doubling all the offerings, a more elaborate, more lavish uh, puja. Tata Sangadikam Pujayet, then he should worship the Sangha, etc. And we find a number of places in, the, in, the, in, this, uh, in this parallel where Shaiva elements are skipped over and instead there's a Sangha Bojana or a Sangha Pujna introduced, making offerings to monks and so forth. 
Um, sometimes it seems to take the place of Homer. One could say as a general observation that um, this uh, Jaina uh, version of the ritual procedure more or less completely excludes Homer, but actually not completely. It excludes Homer from the regular worship, and that's very different from the Shaiva case. Shaiva case consists of puja, japa, and Homer. Three things are required. Making offerings to the deity, uh, visualized first internally and then in this external substrate. Uh, gratifying the deity by reciting the mantra, the root, the root mantra, a certain number of times, followed by the ancillary mantras recited for a certain number of times. And then finally, gratification, tarpanam, of those mantras by offerings into fire. The Shaivas allow you to skimp on that. You don't have to do it every time you do puja, but you can't eliminate it altogether. The, the Jaina version excludes it. So at first sight, I thought, ah, this is interesting. Here we have the Jain anxiety about kindling fire. It's not appropriate in the religious case because it destroys living creatures. And so here we have, as it were, a purified... This is one thing that's been sacrificed in the production of the, of the Jaina version. But in fact, Homer does appear here and there. And it does also appear, it appears, for example, in the Bhupariksha Vidhi. It also appears in the Shakta materials, the Jaina Shakta materials. So there isn't actually a, a nice, clean di division there. Um, there's a kind of overlap. But nonetheless, we see a desire to push it out as much as possible or to marginalize it. Now, we're running out of time. I think I'm being expected to speak for one hour, no? Approximately? <coughs> yeah. So we're coming to the end. And so I'm going to jump ahead to a rather fascinating passage, um, which is on page nine uh, in the middle, Hrit Pratishta. And I've put beneath that the words, Prasada Chaitanya Sambandha, connecting the temple with consciousness. The temple has been built, the deity has been installed, but the temple itself is inanimate. It needs to be animated. And the Shaivas developed a rather extraordinary ritual to this end. A small model of a, of a purusha, a person, a homunculus made of gold was prepared. It was animated by the installation of mantras, all the mantras you need to be an incarnate being, all the, sorry, all the tattvas, all the levels of reality which you need in order to be an experiencer in samsara are installed in this uh, uh, golden purusha. It is then placed in a pot, which is also ritually prepared, and then it's placed above the shukanasa, I don't know what the correct term in English for that architectural feature is, the, 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 um, the parrot's beak, which is above the entrance to the temple, so middle of the middle height of the temple. There's a niche where this is installed. And this is supposed to, as it were, once that's been done, um, that, as it were, makes the temple conscious. So this is why I've called it, following, in fact, Somashambhu, Prasada Chaitanya Sambandha. Well, the giants were happy with that, adopted it word for word, of course, they can't talk about Shivagya, the command of Shiva. They talk about Jinagya instead, as you will see halfway down the page. But everything else is exactly the same, including the installation of all the tattvas. Now, the tattvas installed in this person, this personification in the temple, is not all the Shaiva tattvas, not all the way up to Shiva. This is an intermediate being known as a pralayakala in the Shaiva case. Uh, a subject on the pralayakala level, it has all the tattvas up to kala, up to maya, in fact, but no further. It's not enlightened being. It's somehow a transmigrator. So the temple in this model is seen as a kind of transmigratory being rather than Shiva himself, which is perhaps surprising. Um, but you will see that beginning, uh, yeah, it's actually referred to as uh, an ativahaka deha. He's installing in this golden pur purusha an ativahikam dehem, ativahikam dehem sanstapi, having installed a transmigratory body, the body by which the soul can move from incarnation to incarnation. To do that, according to the Shaiva theory, it needs to have this raft of tattvas from Kala all the way down to earth. So the intermediate tattvas, Kala, Vidya, Raga, etc., and then the tattvas known to the Sankhya tradition all the way down to earth. So the, the uh, Jains simply adopt that. Although there's no uh, tradition of these tattvas in Jainism, they're simply taken over, seen as non-problematic, uh, filling up quite a lot of the text, in fact. Uh, and then after one has installed all these tattvas, you'll see on page 11, uh, at the end of the first column on the left, evam tattva vratam vinyasya, having thus installed the collection of tattvas, Nadi dashakam vayu dashakam chavin. He should install 
the ten channels and the ten vital energies. These two come from the Shaiva um, uh, yogic world. They too are adopted, Ida, Pingala, Sushumna, Savitri, and so forth. Um, And then finally, the, the homunculus, this little golden person, is addressed. In the Shaiva case, um, he's commanded, Agyam Shraviyet, he should recite a command to him and say, Kaladipa, Lord of Kala, because his domain reaches up to Kala, Svatatvena sa Shivagya Prasada Stiti Pariyantam Statavyam. You must stay with your tattva here at the command of Shiva as long as this temple endures. Hmm? Exactly the same. On the, on the Jaina case, except that instead of Shivagya, we have Arhadagya at the command of the Arhat. Now, having shown you those parallels, I'd just like to briefly to say um, words that, ignorant, that reveal what I don't know rather than what I do. As you know, um, it, it, might, it would seem that this text and the tradition it represents um, is not well represented in later times. I've counted 12 manuscripts of the text, but I haven't been able to locate, perhaps through not looking hard enough, um, text in the lineage of this text, which repeat it or paraphrase it. If you look at the Shaiva case, we have maybe up to nearly 50 paratis surviving, all of which are reprocessing and modifying the same material, indicating a very lively tradition. But there's nothing, as far as I can see, that really reproduces uh, uh, clones, as it were, with some small modification, what we see in Nirvana Kalika. Now, you might therefore say that this is a kind of aberration, a fringe text which had no importance for the Jain tradition. I think this is um, to jump the gun, because what we do know is that Jainism underwent a very radical reformation from the 11th century onwards, in which various purist groups pushed away this kind of uh, uh, temple-based ritualism, going back to the, uh, art, the, the, the ancient tradition of asceticism, and the emphasizing on the, the importance of the discipline of the of the celibate monastic or the celibate mendicant, um, beginning with the activities of the Karataragacha, but as we know, there are so many other movements which have, as it were, cleaned the board, wiped the, the, the slate clean of these developments. Um, and we see in our early sources in the 11th and 12th century um, a very strong sense of hostility towards what are referred to as Chaityavasins, Chaityavasina, those who live in temples and in mutters attached to temples, who enjoy regal attributes, who live like kings in their monasteries, performing tantric rituals and so forth. This text, it seems to me, to belong, uh, should be seen as belonging to that tradition, as a record of the ritualism of that tradition. And if we don't have more surviving, that may not be because the tradition was irrelevant in its time, but because the giant tradition has undergone a profound Protestant reformation, if you like, in which this ritualism has been marginalized. But I'm talking off the top of my head, it's pure speculation, there are people in this room who will be able to comment on that and set me right, I hope. Thank you very much. <laughs>